Welcome to Photo 2022's Headlines Talk Series, Photo Live. It's so wonderful to see an in-person audience and to welcome those joining us online. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on whose land we meet today, the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. My name is Anushka Fazakli, Director of Monash Gallery of Art, and we are proud to be partnering with Photo to present the Photo Live Talks. Photo 2022 International Festival of Photography is currently taking place in galleries and public spaces across Melbourne and regional Victoria, featuring 123 artists in 90 exhibitions. The whole festival responds to one thing, being human. Photo Live delves further into the contemporary human condition and addresses the social and cultural role photography plays in our lives across eight events. We will also explore through these talks how art can activate cities and public spaces. I'm really excited for this evening's Photo Live talk, the body, personal, political and performative. Our chair today is Naomi Cass, Director of Castlemaine Art Museum and our guest speakers are Photo 2022 exhibiting artist Florian Hertz, Tandy Wei Maru and Honey Long and Prue Stent. I'd like to thank Photo Live partners ACME, Metro Tunnel Creative Program, as well as education partners RMIT, Monash University and Photography Studies College. We hope you enjoy the event and they can join us for the following Photo Live talks. I'll now hand over to you, Naomi. Thank you very much, Anushka. Thank you, Lindsay and Elias for inviting me uh, to chair this evening. I too joyfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Wurundjeri and the Boon Wurrung, peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Being human in some respects is distinguished from other beings through this act of communication with other humans, through language, text, through images, touch. Sometimes it's successful, very often it's a miserable failure. <laughs> Think for a moment about the biblical Tower of Babel and how we are often bound within the limitations of our language, of our culture. When we really want to reach out to other people. What do we hear or see when we are confronted with difference? This is the great invitation of Photo 2022, to be open to other bodies, to other genders, nationalities, and importantly, to be confronted with art in places other than the white cube, in parks and gardens, in grungy laneways, scaling huge structures or proudly propped on your way to the station. Indeed, when I visited the festival on the weekend on Sunday, I encountered some very human interventions with the festival's very fine installations. Firstly, the two monumental oculi works on the steps of Parliament were totally obscured by a peaceful yet vociferous demonstration by the Sri Lankan community. It wasn't in English. Their placards were not in English like the Tower of Babel, but they were many people deep. It was very orderly. It was like the photographs were the unintentional backdrops, that in the Parliament, of course, to a passionate display of human values. Secondly, and quite confrontingly, all of when I walked from the par, um, parliament to the 
little park next to Parliament where Florian's work is installed, all of them had been pushed over. They were all appeared to be floating in the rather genteel fountains, the water from the fountain. I wonder, of all the works I saw on Sunday, why were Florian's works, why had they been manhandled to the ground? Tonight's panel is a crack at being human across cultures and time zones. While English is our common language, it comes at a compromise generously made by those for whom English is not their first language, and I thank you. I thank tonight's speakers for their time in preparation, the time they've given me in conversations for this evening, and I acknowledge Tandiwe Moreau, who will join us remotely from New York. Florian Hetz, who has stepped off a plane very recently, and Honey Long and Prustent, who I'm sure all of us know well. So in conversation with the artists, our approach will be to, for me to have a little exchange with each artist so we can all establish our, ourselves sonically within this space, uh, within this auditorium, and then to move to a conversation with 10 minutes at the end for your questions. I'm going to start firstly with Prue and Honey. Um, and I just have three questions for... I can't see you. I'm not allowed to move, am I? It's hard because we're all in a line. Yeah, we're in a straight so line. Like I'm, 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 I'm doing this. Into a circle. I hope that's okay. <laughs> that's better. So this is... We're not going to be able to distill your work in, in a few questions. But um, famously, your work is known to have arisen from playful explorations together yes. as young people. What is the role of collaboration in your work now and how do you keep it so fresh? Um, yeah, I think that our practice has always felt like a friendship, um, which sounds fun, <laughs> but um, it just kind of continues to evolve as our friendship does. And it's kind of always been a process of um, exploring and discovering together. Um, so I think as we move through like different stages of our life and as our friendship changes, the practice kind of seems to reflect that, I would say, yeah. <laughs> when you think. Through. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so Honey and I met when we were like 14 years old and um, I think our practice was grounded very much in like, as you were saying, like a very playful manner. And I think like a lot of 14 year olds, it was about like dressing up and like having fun together and filming and taking photos and, um, yeah, it was definitely like very present over like when we're going through puberty and entering into like womanhood and all that stuff. Um, and I think in a way it's just like continued on in that playful sense as we are getting older and it's like this continuous conversation between the two of us. And yeah, it's like very ingrained in the way in which we just have fun and spend time together and yeah. taking photos has just always it's never been like a very serious thing or like it's just been this like intuitive kind of fun process of like documenting those experiences um yeah it is quite remarkable that it is um still a fresh process so you must be feeding the friendship yeah definitely you know, really 
fulsome, really, it's very generative still. This series um, that is part of the festival is a little darker than your earlier work. I'm not sure if everyone agrees. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to why there is this shift in atmosphere and how you have created that? Mm. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, um, our process is very much reflected in kind of obviously our immediate environments. Um, so like our early work was like, yeah, shot around where we both lived um, on the coast and then we went on like a lot of road trips and like, anyway, long story short, over COVID, we um, were obviously spending a lot of time within our houses and our closest contact, like the natural world was our gardens. Mm. Um, so we drew a lot of inspiration from our gardens during that time. Um, and yeah, I feel like there's often like these figures or like objects suspended in space that have these feelings of like isolation um, and maybe like a sense of like suffocation, um, which were like feelings that we had during that time because we weren't able to be going out into location and like going through our normal process. Mm. Um, but do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I think um, there's like a sense of things feeling kind of like on the brink as well. Um, and yeah, being in this state of isolation, um, but also kind of observing so much online and there being such an excess of information and kind of... Um, consumption going on as well uh I felt like met with this feeling of um like productivity that was um also really like stifled because it was kind of within this like setting of there being a feeling of like disaster or like imminent disaster um and yeah I think we found that in the process of making the work as well it was like uh the 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 drive to create something um felt felt kind of stifled and it felt hard and um, I felt like I wanted to reflect on that kind of, um, yeah, feeling I'd felt in lockdown of uh, just like excessive sort of consumption going on or something. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> it's, it, it's quite remarkable that you have been able to communicate that. I mean, in, in a way, we didn't need to hear you say that. So, yeah, it's amazing. While um, the performative body is pivotal to what you do, so are objects and nature. Can I ask, what comes first? The idea, the body, the object? Do you see an image in your mind's eye, which must be hard when you're two minds? Or is this still pure play? Yeah, I think it's definitely... I think it starts with this process of... Well, firstly, just like us discussing things that we're interested in. Um, but then op shopping and like foraging is definitely like a big part of like the first step of our process, um, which we do not over COVID, obviously, but like do almost daily, um, where we like collect objects and items that kind of speak to the body in like a sensual way, or we just have some kind of immediate reaction to, or like there's a history to those objects that we find interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then often we'll, yeah, be collecting those items over like, sometimes like years, I don't know, and just like hoarding them in our studio. 
Um, and then we spend a lot of time, it's not even scouting locations, but like driving to areas that we find interesting or like, a, yeah, someone tells us to go to like a spot that they think we might like, but it's often places on the way, like on the side of a freeway or like an old dried out pond. Um, mm. And then I feel like it's when, yeah, we, we stumble across these locations and like, there's like a fabric or an object that kind of relates to that location and then we'll go okay let's like try out something and then from there it's just this like very playful kind of intuitive process where yeah we'll try and merge those three together and take some photos and like obviously sometimes it doesn't work but when it does it feels like this like magical moment where those three things come together and yeah um I feel like, yeah, even that one at Hill End, that was like one of those moments mm. where all those three things aligned and, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> now, um, thank you very much. And I'd like to just have a moment with Florian, please. I was moved in our Zoom conversation, quite hard to be moved in a Zoom conversation, <laughs> um, about your comments about looking and desire, and in particular around growing up as a queer child. Right. This seems relevant when looking at the work that um, you're exhibiting here in Melbourne, where normative looking is confounded and challenged and probably why your works were given a new orientation. <laughs> I quite like that, to be honest, like that there is actually a reaction. Like it, it might not be a good reaction, but there is... People don't walk by and be like, meh. Mm. Uh, like it's a shame that they someone feels like the desire to put an aggression towards it, but mm. still it's a reaction. So they, yeah. something is happening that's interesting. So as a young person growing up as a queer child, how, how is looking? I mean, looking just seems to be such an innocent, um, natural thing. But from what I hear, looking is quite contra was controversial or is controversial for young queer people. I think like there's a regular looking at things that's totally like with everyone else, but then there is a a gaze or like looking at something maybe with a desire that is where the society tells you it's not okay. Mm. Like you're not a a straight person, like a straight cis boy looking at a cis girl is totally fine. Like there is, is a normal thing that, oh, there's a cute romance, but a bit like as soon as you're not in that and that um, straight cis um, from family, family, it gets difficult. Like because mm. like you've been told by society, by teachers, by parents, like it's not okay. You cannot look at someone with a desire or that long. Um, so you do it secretly. Like we all do it secretly. Like we there's there's a lot of fantasies, but like we we never really have the chance like to stare or like really mm. kind of like be fascinated by by something even turned on like as a 14 year old like you you do have feelings there's a lot of hormones going on but we always have to repress that or like do it really yeah secretive and that does something to you like there is a lot of hiding a lot of double life pretending that you are someone that you're not and that is basically the starting point or, or what's the starting point of my photography is like to allow myself as a grown-up but also maybe like the the teenager or child kind of like to look closely like really to zoom in into the body and look at these things that I that I wasn't allowed to see that I wasn't allowed to appreciate or like fantasize about or like just admire like it's sometimes has nothing to do with with sexuality just with admiration how does this object the camera um what role does that play what when fun, looking? In a funny way, it's like it gives you permission to stare. Like it is, is, a, is a mean or like a tool where we all kind of like, we look really closely. We can, we can stare at things. Like whereas like if, if you're sitting in a room and you stare at someone too long, it gets uncomfortable, but the camera gives you 
in a way, permission like to to look at something really closely. It's a bit like a, like a microscope, like where you really can zoom in and just like look really carefully. And you see the beauty of, or I see the beauty of details, like the reflection of hair on a hand, mm -hmm. like that all of a sudden, mm -hmm. like when the light is right, all of a sudden creates this beauty. Um, probably without the camera, I would probably not look that closely or might not even recognize that beauty. And are you looking down or are you looking across? What kind of camera? Straight ahead, like, like straight ahead. Like for me, uh, in a weird sense, like being on the same eye level, yeah. like in many ways is quite important. Like the person in front of me has the same importance that I have. Like we, um, like it's my, it's my view on someone, but like we're still, like without that person, I would not be able to, to create because I don't use my own body, I use someone mm. else's body. So you do work with models. They are consciously real people. Yeah. Um, in this context, they are models, but probably not in the rest of their. I lives. prefer the term sitter. Like that kind sitter. of like makes it yeah. always kind of like a little bit more even. Like model sounds really like someone who is doing Italian Vogue poses, <laughs> uh, which uh, no, nothing wrong with that. It just doesn't work with my work. And. W with the, your sitters, and they're not really sitting either, actually. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> In the beginning, I let them sit, and then, like, I, <laughs> I, I amp it up a little bit. Well, tell, tell us, what is your relationship with the sitter or the subject? So for me, it's important that I get to know them. Um, ideally, like, I meet someone a week or two weeks beforehand in a neutral space, like, be it a cafe or just go for a walk and give them the chance to ask me questions, to get to know me. And like, I know when people don't know me and see me, they see, see a tattoo, they see that I'm tall, I don't have hair. Like, I might look a little bit intimidating, but then like having the chance to actually meet me and see like I'm, I'm kind of okay. You're a person. Yeah, like I'm, <laughs> I'm quite approachable. He's human. <laughs> and, um, but also like, there's a lot of questions about like what's happening, like when when we shoot, what's happening, and like this is an important thing, like that these things are um, talked about beforehand. Like a big part of our job is when we work with people is to to literally bring their shoulders down, like to mm -hmm. make them relax and feel comfortable in front of a camera, mm -hmm. and like getting to know each other. I think helps me, but also helps them. Like the next time we see each other, they're going to be in front of my camera, probably naked, which is a really unnatural thing like most people would agree with me that it's like not really normal that you have the situation mm -hmm. but like for, m for me my job is to cr to make that normal and like have these people leave later on and say oh, that was nice or I could have done that forever beautiful but that in that's a lot of investment so like we meet we talk they ask me questions I ask questions as well like I want to know who I shoot I don't want to have a anonymous person for me like the most stressful thing is to have a shoot with someone who I didn't have the chance to meet beforehand and just have a random, not random, but like anonymous person in front of me. And do they have a role other than just being? Um, role is a big word. Um, I'm not really sure if it's a role, but like they play in that sense a, a big role, but that we, we have an ongoing conversation while I shoot. Mm -hmm. So like it is like mm, it's a lot of laughter. Like I, d I don't take things too serious. Like uh, we we continues to talk, and bits and pieces of their what they tell me goes always into the photos as well. So in that sense, yes, they have yes. a role. Like they inform with their being, with their answers, or with their mm. conversation skills. Like my my work as well. You but also their body informs it. Like yes. scars, for example. Like they tell a story and like. Scars is something that I'm really fascinated because they r there's a biography behind it. Sometimes it's really painful, and then uh, for me it's always important like if people are fine with that. Or generally, I want to know what is okay mm. for you. I don't want to put someone in a position where someone feels really uncomfortable in front of the camera. I don't want to put the spotlight on something where they really. But it does f f seem like the camera is reading the body, the yeah. skin. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Pleasure. And Tandiwe. Sorry, I have had my back to you. <laughs>
Hello. Can you... Hi. It's very nice that you are here and thank you for being up very early. The festival has been at the end of your previous day and the beginning of this day. Can Tandiwe, can you speak to us about the role of fabric in your work and what this wildly expressive fabric that you use, what is it called? Tell us about it. So the fabric is called Ankara, which is found mostly in Western Africa. But um, I come from East Africa and we enjoy wearing it, especially when we want to look our best. So if you want to pull out all the stops, you wear Ankara fabric. And um, it's, I say in my work, it is the blank canvas in which I can celebrate and question things about my culture, especially my place as a woman and just being a woman in a very conservative culture, but in a more modern role as a photographer. Um, and I tend to use fabric that is very, Ankara comes in all kinds of different prints and patterns, but I'm usually drawn to very geometric patterns, maybe because they're more modern, maybe because they speak more to who I am as a person, but I use them to create garments that then the subjects in my images wear and to then create kind of this otherworldly kind of images. Because mm. the fabrics often have, um, they're often with objects or representational, but you are selecting very geometric um, patterns, yes. And also you are, I work with models, I, I believe, and that these are consciously real models who embody a kind of diversity in their form. How do these bodies stand for an independent, strong Kenyan or African woman? I think I'm always looking for women to feature in my images who represent what I have been taught growing up or heard subconsciously from my culture as um, being a negative thing. So one of the things I do a lot in my work is choosing women who are very dark skinned because in my culture, I feel like we're always being told, um, you know, dark is bad. I choose them with short hair, for example, because that's a reality of what beauty looks like for me as an African woman. And yet we're always taught we need long flowing hair. And so I'm always picking my models to reflect what I think is beautiful about my culture and where I come from, but I've always been told is wrong with my body or is wrong with who I am. Uh, yes, it's ubiquitous, isn't it? Um, in the series from which the work you are showing in Melbourne comes, you pair each of the photographs within the series with an African proverb. What is the role of these proverbs in your culture, in Kenyan culture, and why have you included them in this series? I think when I began as a photographer, it was always about the image and showing what I wanted through an image. But the one thing about the Camo series is it's made me have to get to know my culture better and learn my culture in a way I didn't previously. Um, I think there is a notion sometimes in Kenya that if you're modern, you don't do anything traditional and you don't want to really interact closely with the traditional way of doing things. But in exploring this series, I've had to ask questions about who am I? Uh, why do we do what we do? Why do we adorn ourselves the way we do? Um, why do we wear fabrics the way we do? And in that process, I began to ask a question of, why am I not seeing more images? Why do I find a lot of written um, information about our history? But I actually don't see many images. And I realized that Kenyan culture is a very oratory culture. We, we used to use words to pass on wisdom, to pass on knowledge, to pass on principles. And I thought if I'm truly celebrating what I love about my culture, it has to include words because the portrait of beauty of my culture is not complete without them. Fabulous. Thank you very much. So um, the, our three artists have inhabited the space with their words and their images. So um, now we come to trying to have a conversation. 
we will give it a go and a real conversation. No one knows what I'll be asking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the first thing I want to, everyone, forgive my um, turning away. This is very strange because part of um, being human is, is to make eye contact with people. So please, <laughs> feel like I can't, I've only got one, one head. Um, what I'm really interested in is how your work is framed by the festival and it's very hard for Tandiwe to um, answer that because uh, obviously she's not here. Um, but Tandiwe's work is down a, a lane. It's gargantuan in size. One turns a corner and is almost assaulted by the glorious colour, the pattern, the visage framed by a very Melbourne lane, grey, dark Melbourne laneway. Florian's work is framed by a walled, genteel city park and it confounds the visual presentation of human form and it invites the viewer to step forward and contemplate. While Prue and Honey's work is a fully fledged exhibition, carefully articulated in surprising ways in a beautiful white cube. So perhaps um, Honey or Prue, your work is usually or mostly framed by a gallery or a book. How relevant or important is the space, the, the, the passage of the viewer that explores your work in a gallery, the framing of a gallery? Um, I think it changes so much because, um, you know, you have your work shown in a gallery, you show your work online these days. Um, and I think the, the beauty of showing in a gallery space is being able to, um, yeah, formulate that that story um, and that viewing experience for people. Um, so definitely when we're putting together a series for a gallery space, um, I think we really enjoy thinking about um, the pairings of the photographs and it gives us this opportunity to to tell more of a story um, and for someone to come in and see the images in relation to each other. Um, whereas, you know, when you're showing, when you're putting work out online, it's very much about just like the singular image and, and that being arresting and you wanting to grab people's attention or whatever. So it's really nice to have the gallery space to kind of expand the story, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, and I think also having, I guess, the freedom to experiment with scale and, like, framing and printing and the papers that you use, like, that is so important when you're trying to express an idea through photography. So that has been, like, yeah, such a privilege, I guess, like, being able to work with the gallery and have that space to then also have the freedom to choose all those things. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, as Honey was just saying, like, with the pairings and, like, the way in which it's laid out and we want the story to be told, like, having um, control over that is, yeah, important for our work. Yeah. yeah. And I think we like bringing together kind of unlikely pairings as well. Or yeah. Yeah. Like because a lot of the works, connection. when they were just by themselves, we probably wouldn't have included in the show, but in relation to each other, it made a lot more sense. Mm. Um, so it was, it would be a different process to like posting a photo on Instagram or like just having one artwork that was like a standalone thing. Yeah. Like our most recent show definitely is like as a grouping, it kind of makes sense, but individually it doesn't. Can we take that thread mm. and can I invite Tandiwe to say something because you mentioned to me that your work is primarily made or firstly perhaps firstly made for a Kenyan audience and you're showing all over the world and they're not traveling. <laughs> um, yeah that's an interesting one. 
I think at the core, when I create my work, I'm not even thinking of the final presentation. Everything for me is about the message, about taking the viewer with me on a journey through um, questioning my perception of myself, the things I love about my culture, the things I struggle with about my culture, the things I love and hate about my body. And I have no idea where this journey is going. I don't have a final destination in mind, but I want to take you with me on that journey and to the story that I'm going through. And then where it goes is almost secondary. But I do, I found more and more, I am very excited by images in the wrong context um, or in an unexpected presentation. So I love having my image then down an alleyway because that's not really where you'd expect to find art. But I feel like so much of my work is around that, you know, looking for the unexpected or finding the beauty in the unexpected. Um, I use, for example, objects in my work and I'm taking everyday objects that you'd normally walk by and ignore and turning them into something that stops you in your tracks. And so having the work in a place that stops you in your tracks um, because you're like, wait, that doesn't fit, excites me as an artist and I think gives a, a deeper experience in, in interacting with the art because you have to question so much. You would expect to see art in a gallery, but in other places, it gives you the opportunity to think about it in a fresh way and to be challenged by, you know, how do I feel about art not in the right place? Thank you. Speaking about, um, speaking of being challenged, Florian, your work is explicit and erotic, it's confronting. How has this been managed within a completely unmediated public setting outside of your control? Okay, I'm German. I'm generally quite controlling, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I do like to like to direct and have like I have a clear idea of like how I want to present like similar like you to say like the pairing is really important for me. Um, it was therefore it was quite exciting to actually let that go here and like completely trust Elias and Brandon like to and the team like to put it together and um, just literally like let things go, let the photos go and I've, I'm positively surprised. I was really like it's, I wasn't fearful. I knew that I could trust them, but um, still on the back of my head it was kind of like. I, I'm not like I would like to, but then like seeing it, and I'm just being completely happy of what's happening. Um, and are you comfortable that some works of the series have been selected? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think like I mean, th th there's a general decision been made that the work that we selected were is is more neutral. They are not too sexual or not too erotic. Like that has um has several reasons that for me make completely sense like in a in a white cube or like inside probably would have shown something else like yeah. we have that amazing opportunity to have that augmented reality exhibition at angel music bar where you actually see a little bit different work mm -hmm. so like th there's a clear choice between outside and inside like inside is always a different different area where people actually enter and see something on by their choice with whereas while you're outside you if you like it or not you will pass by and see it so like we i think paid tribute to that and it's good like as Tandive said like it's quite nice like to have w artwork like in unexpected places where you wouldn't like, where you pass by and like your work like in this alleyway is mind-blowing like i saw, saw it today mm -hmm. and it's just like it's perfect where it is. Like it, it leaves such a strong, like impression. Just and like you cannot pass by and not stop. Mm. Like it, it, you, it will stop you on the tracks, which is quite beautiful. Thank you. So now I'm going to throw you all a question. I w I'd like you to tell me um, about the materiality of your work. Is it important to you? Where does the f f um, physicality of the print lie in a kind of overall gestalt or effect of your work? Does physical engagement have primacy, do you think, over the digital engagement with your work? 
I, it's so important. <laughs> like, <laughs> Trick it's, question. it's like the most important thing probably for me. Like digital is nice. Like we have the chance today like to bring imagery out and like a lot of people see them. Like I get messages from Pakistan or from Tehran of people that probably would have not been able to see the work and that I really appreciate that. But being able to print something out like on a paper that you choose and the paper makes a lot of sense is such a special thing and like just holding that little it's not little but th th that object in your hand like feels like a, uh, sometimes I say like it's 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 a bit like a birth of a child like it's yeah. something so special yeah like it's th there's nothing i can compare it to and for me it's always important to see prints from artists like it's nice to see get a first impression from from the internet a second impression from a book the third like the most important one is like mm. to see the actual finished product it's so fantastic that um, this is the reality of photography that um, I, I don't have the pleasure of working in a photography specific organisation anymore but I really miss that aspect of photography that the, the fi there's the file and then there's the print. Mm. Does anyone else want to pipe in about the pleasures of the the body of the photograph? I agree with what you said. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I was just thinking about like the internet and like how like social media was such a, played such an integral part to us being able to get to that like um, next stage of being able to print. So like being able to share our work and like getting enough like, I don't know, momentum going. And then yeah, having the opportunity then to like exhibit somewhere and seeing it printed and it is just such a magical moment right. seeing it come to life and you hear people that like yeah when they're in the dark room like when it comes to life in that way it is something very very special um and yeah like even like yeah getting a disposal camera developed like there's something very special in having that like tactile thing that you can keep yeah. um but yeah 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 tendiwe do you have also share the pleasure of the actual print? I do, M um, maybe for slightly different reasons. I think it's amazing, like everybody has said, to share your work on the internet, but you have no control over its presentation mm -hmm. and are the colors right? Um, and scale, scale is a big thing for me. So I love my work in this huge, you know, even the prints that I sell are huge prints because it's, it has more presence to me. And so being able to go through the process of actually seeing the work, which is tiny on my camera when I'm shooting it, tiny on my screen when I'm looking at it, and then it becomes this huge piece when I print it. There's just something exciting and amazing. And it almost is like, that's a final step in bringing the work to life. That's very different from an online experience. Mm. So we're edging our way to the body in what ways is your work anchored to the flesh? And do you think that your relationship with the body, all of the three, three, four people and three artists, how do you think your relationship to the body will change over time? Mm. Um, yeah, I think you're like, working with the body you're working with this thing that is so vulnerable and um so transient and i think part of the desire to work with the body in the first place is is to kind of um maybe make sense of that and connect to that and the idea that you can um sort of document that over time is really um beautiful to me like i was looking at um uh some of hannah wilkes wilkie wilkie wilkes anyway <laughs> hannah wilkes work today and um she had a self-portrait of herself in her 20s um like it was naked and she was lying on the floor with tattoos. And then next to that, there was a, a picture of her um, as an older woman and she'd had a mastectomy and um, 
you know, was like missing one of her breasts and there was like this amazing kind of, yeah, just like those two images in itself were, um, I think, so special. And yeah, so I don't know. I think um, being able, like photograph photography being there to kind of capture and make sense of the experience of inhabiting this body that's eventually going to die is pretty amazing. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we can add that. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else? I, um, um, I was going to add on to what Prun Honey <coughs> said, and I think it will be interesting to see how, as the body changes, my perception of myself will change. I may grow to love things that um, I didn't love before, or some things that physically will change and that will reflect in my work, physically change on me and that will reflect in my work. Um, and my relationship with my body, I don't think you ever settle. Your, your relationship with the body is always changing, whether it's how you view other people's bodies or your own. And I think that is what will show through my work over time. And maybe what will I highlight, what will I hide more? will become the focus of my relationship and a reflection of my relationship with my body. You said something interesting to me that the models you use bear some relationship to you and that in a way you're not in the photographs but perhaps they are about your body. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's, there's things that I've always found beautiful in women that I may not have. And so maybe I subconsciously select models who have those things as a way of saying, you know, I wish I looked like that. And then there's some things about myself that I'm trying to make peace with in my body that I'm trying to make peace with. And sometimes I'll select a model who has similar features because I want to see, can I make this beautiful even if I struggle with feeling like it's not? Mm -hmm. Do you think I, I think what would be more relevant for you would be to ask how you find the bodies in your work, the the um, sitters. Well, technically, they find me. Yeah. Um, I'm in a privileged situation where that a lot of people write me to be part of my work. Yeah. And like that is like going back to the digital space that is the the advantage like that a lot of people know or can see our work and so like they contact me mostly online and um i don't have a criteria like there's never been really like a type or like a certain like you have to be that tall or like that young or that skinny or that big it's kind of like for me it's like the the openness of someone to wanting to participate and no one needs to be happy or like 100% proud of mm -hmm. their body, but they need to be willing just to accept that I look at them and like find my way of looking at them and like presenting my my idea of like their beauty in that. Um, in the last, uh, in the COVID time, like I, I moved away from the body naturally, like there was not really, it was not really the time to deal with people. And I actually quite enjoyed that. Like it's the first time that I actually, that I started to shoot other things. And um, that's an interesting development. I don't think I'm gonna move away from the body totally, but I'm quite happy to incorporate other other things or like my view on other, and sometimes on objects. Um, that, that there's an interesting new development in, in terms of body that I'm, quite enjoyed COVID that I didn't have to deal yeah. with people. <laughs> um, forgive me, I can't remember the name of the book you sent me. A, um, the last one, Ico. Yeah. yeah. The relationship between the objects and the bodies was m m breathtaking, R really extraordinary. In a way, like a, an object is a body as well. Yeah. Like, and I think like I, I treated in a similar way, like I, I look at it in a similar way, um, that I look at a, a human body and mm. the the dialogue that, that starts with these two things is quite interesting for me. So like in the sense of like when we put on like exhibitions and like what you said, like how important the dialogue is, the same like when you create a book, it's like you have two pages and for me it's always important that there is a, a conversation 
like and you might not be you don't have to necessarily understand the conversation but for me it's quite important that there is a dialogue going on uh, I think well I don't know if it's the right conversation but um, the pairings the pages were very audible yeah mm. well, I, well, there's definitely you are commun communicating um, honey could you um, speak to us about the objects in your the ones in your show they are also <laughs> remarkable mm. um yeah so we included um alongside the photographs um a series of glass pieces that are um blown glass um that me and Prue made together in the hot shop <laughs> and um yeah I think glass has this really uh amazing ability to um capture transience and um you know you're making a bubble you're blowing into a pipe and blowing out a bubble um and there's all these different uh, forces acting on the bubble that's gonna um create the end sort of shape but um if the wall gets too thin it'll kind of fold in on itself or um you can slump it and it can start to deflate and there's this sense of like um yeah something deflating or um having having been used or just like kind of capturing a moment and I think um and it's also a container like it's a container of breath and in in the um pieces that we have in the show they're kind of slumped onto the frames with the photos and um we've put different kind of like fluids in there um so I don't know I think they just kind of like crystallize the sort of feeling that we wanted to they are so abject. <laughs> they yeah. are really amazing, um, grim kind of um, the presence of something that is or should be absent. They really – they work so beautifully with the photography. Mm -hmm. Prue, is there something – I didn't realise you'd made them together. Oh, uh, not really. I, like, catch the glass. <laughs> 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 so thank yeah, you, honey. part of the process. Yeah, but I think, like, because, yeah, we often work – in like a very performative or like you know with like sculptural kind of disciplines like within the photography practice it's really nice to bring in that physical element of sculpture as well um and I think it just speaks very nicely to the body and yeah encapsulates a feeling that we're trying to communicate through the photos as well mm. um yeah yeah Tandiwe do you make the um objects in your work Many times I do, unless it's technically, I don't have the technical skill, but many yeah. times I do. Um, yes, I make them by hand. And you're taking something and, um, forgive me, I can't remember <laughs> all, the ob all the materials that you're using. A rubbish bin lid, I remember, and you talked about how that was a, an object of play for a child. But you are recontextualizing objects T tell us something about uh, the importance or the meaning of those objects for you and your um, viewers, because presumably your fellow country women and country men would recognise them. The objective is for them, I think, to not quite recognise them, but to read about it and realise they know this object and it's something familiar. So much like Honey and Prue, whenever I'm travelling, wherever I go, I'm always um, collecting things and I have this big box of random objects that I think could make beautiful accessories. Many times it's eyewear, sometimes it's, it's jewellery of another form. And um, I, it's a way to celebrate the resourcefulness of my culture. So, of course, coming from Africa, you know, we're many times people in Africa for the poverty and there's a lot of negative press around that. And I thought... I want to try and see the beauty in, in, in this, 
in a very difficult thing. And I have found one of the things that comes out of a lot of poverty is a lot of resourcefulness. And that is something very unique and beautiful about where I come from. And so I take everyday objects and repurpose them into something beautiful, which is what many Kenyans do every day. They just don't realize they're creating art or, you know, recycling in a creative way. Um, so I use things like, you know, mosquito coils. I use things like bottle caps. I've used things like drinking straws to fashion all these um, different types of accessories. And, um, Many of the objects that I use are objects that I've interacted with in my childhood or I do so on a daily basis. And so there's always a story or a memory behind the objects that I use. And it's a way of celebrating the resourcefulness, yes, but also of bringing my lived experience into my images in an interesting way. Hmm. I'd like to ask it the fellow panellists, do you think that there is something implicitly political about representing the body? After all, it's co-opted with such differing and opposing ideologies. It's in religious imagery, advertising, bureaucracy. Is there a particular meaning which attends to the body in your work or is this a more sensuous sort of essential expression for you because I'm, political was in the title of our um session <laughs> so i'm just interested in whether it it holds a political meaning for you it may not um i think i think you can i think in our work um both kind of exist side by side. Definitely um, there's the political element and then there's also the element of, um, yeah, just kind of wanting to celebrate the body in its um, sensuousness and mystery. Um, but, yeah, I think we, like, play with... Um, the different associations the female body has and and the different um, symbolisms it's kind of come to inhabit um, and uh, I think we, I don't know, talk about this feeling a lot of, um, yeah, the female body feeling like something that's yours and not yours at the same time. Um, on the one hand, you know, it's yours, you're inhabiting it. And then on the other, there's all these cultural projections that are placed onto it. And then also in like another sense, you have that embedded awareness of like um, having the potential to create another... Um, human and birth it and you're kind of existing in this in this long line of bodies um and can you add to that oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> five minutes oh, oh man that that was such an amazing statement <laughs> <laughs> maybe florian can <laughs> florian do you want to say something <laughs> so for me it's exactly I, like i work like mostly with the male body, um, and there's a there's a conscious decision for me like that. I think like the female body has been abused by men over centuries. Like mm. I don't need to add to that, but on the other hand, like for me, it's quite important that the generally the naked body is political in the sense that we live in a time where like, I think there's a big pushback in terms of being liberate or like being open about the body. Like Instagram took over the, the role of the church in sense of censoring kind of like we, they, Mark Zuckerberg and co like, mm -hmm. like pushes like all of these morals, ethics from the states over on us. Like European children grow up like with the idea that the female nipple is pornographic, which is odd for me, like because I grew up in a different time where it was completely normal. Um, but also, like the naked male body is has been hidden away most of the yeah. time because it's like the man doesn't need it. Like the woman is the object, the man is like 
I think so for me it's important like to also like to bring that to light and like to show the male body there's this weird thing of uh, the male body is not beautiful which I don't believe in like I think the male body has to offer as any other body like a lot of beauty and it's quite important for me to show that mm. three minutes <laughs> Ten Tendue, you've got one minute <laughs> all right or two minutes <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm loving my head is it's spinning. There's just so much rich, you know, information in, in this conversation. Um, I think I view it very differently. My work almost takes away the sensuality, and it's it's not even about the body. Um, it's about beauty itself, separate from almost separate from the body, because my models are almost always fully clothed and covered. And I don't want you to see them, but I want you to see the the full picture of, of you know, what I'm creating. Um, is it political? Not very much so, <clears throat> but I do think because I'm addressing things that have been reinforced in our culture that are very different from, um, I think the space we were traditionally in, there is a little you know, political in there, but that's not my core focus. My core focus is to just celebrate beauty away from making it anything, you know, central. We didn't have time for questions, so we shall linger. <laughs> and the questions will be off camera, which is in itself, you know what. <laughs> I thank the traditional owners for having us on their unceded country. I thank the speakers, one, two, three, and four for your generosity because you've already made your work so speaking with us is a kind of special bonus i thank the festival and its supporters and i thank you who when you look at the work of art you bring it to life thank you You know me for uh, allowing us into such amazing artist work and to engage in a discussion about photography in so many different ways. I thank everyone here for joining us live and online and I hope you'll continue to join us in this amazing series of photo talks all about photography. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much, that was amazing.